sound check, sound check. Sound check. <laughs> Sound check. <laughs> Uh, sound check, sound check. Sound check, mic test, one, two.
the Nurse Channel. If you are encountering problems in internet connectivity, kindly refresh the page. For UP Manila live stream, kindly turn up the volume using the audio icon. For other problems, please refer to the downloadable guide at the bottom of the live stream window. The webinar lecture will run for 20 to 30 minutes, followed by a question and answer portion. Ask questions or comment by typing into the UP Manila live stream Q&A box on the right lower corner of your screen, or type into the comments box in FB Live or YouTube Live. A link to an online evaluation form will be sent to The webinar will begin in 10 minutes. Please stand by. Welcome to today's webinar. This is part of a year-long medical webinar series on aging and longevity, an initiative of the New Sigma Phi sorority in celebration of its 85th year. In cooperation with the UP College of Medicine, the UP Medical Foundation, and the New Sigma Phi Foundation. The beneficiary for this project is the National Institutes of Health Institute on Aging. This webinar series runs every second and last Friday from January to November 2019 and delivers interactive medical lectures by prominent specialists here and abroad on common medical conditions in the geriatric population. The webinars are free and open to all physicians, healthcare professionals, and medical and allied medical students. CPD units for MDs, nurses, and pharmacists will be provided. Registration is free. If you have pre-registered, you only need to sign in for attendance check. Otherwise, please register on-site. Just click on the links for today's webinar at the bottom of the UPM Livestream window or in the description box of FB Live or YouTube Live. This is an important step that you need to do to have your attendance recorded and to receive the link to the evaluation form. 
Once you sign in for attendance, the post-webinar confirmation email will be sent within 12 to 24 hours and not immediately. To ensure that you receive your certificates in your inbox, please be reminded of the following. Make sure that your details are complete and spelled correctly, especially your names and registered email addresses. Please do not abbreviate. Example, yahoo.com into y.com. Ensure that your email inbox is not full and add these email addresses flashed on your screen to your contacts. Check your spam folder and if our emails landed there, mark them as not spam. We are now using UB Manila Livestream, FB Live at Aging Webinars, and YouTube Live at Aging Webinars channel. If you are encountering problems in internet connectivity, kindly refresh the page. For UP Manila Livestream, kindly turn up the volume using the audio icon. For other problems, please refer to the downloadable guide at the bottom of the Livestream window. The webinar lecture will run for 20 to 30 minutes, followed by a question and answer portion. Ask questions or comment by typing into the UP Manila Livestream Q&A box on the right lower corner of your screen or type into the comments box in FB Live or YouTube Live. A link to an online evaluation form will be sent to your registered email addresses two days after the confirmation email is sent after the webinar. Please answer the online evaluation form to receive your certificate in your registered email inbox around two to four weeks after the webinar depending on the number of participants and CPD unit approval. The webinar will begin in five minutes. Please stand by. Welcome to today's webinar. This is part of a year-long medical webinar series on aging and longevity, an initiative of the New Sigma Phi sorority in celebration of its 85th year, in cooperation with the UP College of Medicine, the UP Medical Foundation, and the New Sigma Phi Foundation. The beneficiary for this project is the National Institutes of Health Institute on Aging. This webinar series runs every second and last Friday from January to November 2019 and delivers interactive medical lectures by prominent specialists here and abroad on common medical conditions in the geriatric population. The webinars are free and open to all physicians, healthcare professionals, and medical and allied medical students. CPD units for MDs, nurses, and pharmacists will be provided. Registration is free. If you have pre-registered, you only need to sign in for attendance check. Otherwise, please register on-site. Just click on the links for today's webinar at the bottom of the UPM Livestream window or in the description box of FB Live or YouTube Live. This is an important step that you need to do to have your attendance recorded 
and to receive the link to the evaluation form. Once you sign in for attendance, the post-webinar confirmation email will be sent within 12 to 24 hours and not immediately. To ensure that you receive your certificates in your inbox, please be reminded of the following. Make sure that your details are complete and spelled correctly, especially your names and registered email addresses. Please do not abbreviate. Example, yahoo.com into y.com. Ensure that your email inbox is not full and add these email addresses flashed on your screen to your contacts. Check your spam folder and if our emails landed there, mark them as not spam. We are now using UB Manila Livestream, FB Live at Aging Webinars, and YouTube Live at Aging Webinars channel. If you are encountering problems in internet connectivity, kindly refresh the page. For UP Manila Livestream, kindly turn up the volume using the audio icon. For other problems, please refer to the downloadable guide at the bottom of the Livestream window. The webinar lecture will run for 20 to 30 minutes, followed by a question and answer portion. Ask questions or comment by typing into the UP Manila Livestream Q&A box on the right lower corner of your screen or type into the comments box in FB Live or YouTube Live. A link to an online evaluation form will be sent to your registered email addresses two days after the confirmation email is sent after the webinar. Please answer the online evaluation form to receive your certificate in your registered email inbox around two to four weeks after the webinar depending on the number of participants and CPD unit approval. Good morning, everyone. I am Ana Francesca Mulias, New Sigma Phi Sorority Batch 2018, speaking on behalf of the Aging and Longe Longevity Webinars team of the New Sigma Phi Sorority. We are streaming live from the video conference room of the UP Manila Information Management Service. Our time in Manila is now exactly 12 noon. We have a total of 900 plus registered to this webinar from all over the Philippines and from other countries as well. For today's webinar, we are privileged to have a distinguished alumna of the UP College of Medicine, Class 1986. She completed her residency training in internal medicine at the University of the Philippines, Philippine General Hospital in 1990 and her fellowship training in respirology at the Asthma Center, University of Toronto, the Toronto Hospital Western Division in 1992. She finished her pulmonary medicine fellowship in PGH in 1994 and her master's degree in clinical epidemiology at the College of Medicine, UP Manila in 2005. She is currently an associate professor at the UP College of Medicine and is the head of the Committee on Re Research of the UP PGH Section of Pulmonary Medicine, is a member of the UPCM Admissions Committee, a general medicine service consultant at the UP PGH, a technical reviewer at the UPPGH Department of Medicine Clinical Research Division and UPCMRIDO, a consultant staff at Manila Doctors Hospital and the Execom Chair of the PGH Asthma Comprehensive Care Unit. She has won several awards in research, the academy, and is a two-time board top-notcher at her diplomate exam in internal medicine and Philippine College of Chess Physicians. Ladies and gentlemen, we are proud and honored to welcome Dr. Eileen D. Wang, New Sigma Phi Sorority, Batch 1986. Thank you very much, Anses, for that very nice and kind introduction. And I would also like to thank the new webinar team for inviting me today to give this presentation. So, first of all, these are my disclosures. I am in the advisory board and I speak and a recipient and I am a recipient of conference grants from the various pharmaceuticals that market asthma and COPD drugs. So I think I'm conflicted. And I'm also an active clinical trialist. So I was asked today to talk about two very important 
chronic respiratory diseases in the country, and they are big and in scope. So I'm afraid we're going to have a longer presentation for today. And basically, my objectives are, one, to give you updates on the diagnosis and management of the two diseases and the combination thereof, and the effect of aging on the lungs and its rela relationship with these um, diseases. So first, let's talk about the aging lung. Of course, we know that aging is characterized by a progressive loss of physiological integrity, leading to impaired function and increased vulnerability to, to, to death. In fact, aging has emerged as the single greatest risk factor for various chronic non-communicable diseases, driving increased morbidity and mortality. And what I'm showing you here in this graph are three important chronic respiratory diseases. And as you will see, COPD, most forms of lung cancers, and idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, their incidence will tend to increase as we age. And why does this happen? So what I have in this beautiful diagram here, showing you the stochastic or um, random determined, uh, randomly determined nature and interplay of both genetic predisposition, and that will include epigenetic factors, and environmental factors as they drive the development of chronic disease. So these together will act on the various cells of the lungs, the alveolar epithelial cells, the fibroblasts, the smooth muscle endothelial cells, and even the immune and stem cells. And all these, the, based on the relative strength and overall integration of the various challenges and predisposing factors, will go towards the development of these respiratory diseases. So COPD, IPF, and even lung cancer. Now COPD and IPF, their development overlaps with lung cancer, as indicated by this arrow. And as we mentioned, these three diseases are commonly found in patients who are aging. And why this is so? There's a beautiful, nice discourse by Lopez Otin, published um, a few years back, showing you the nine hallmarks of aging. So first, the primary hallmarks, the causes of damage in our um, body, genetic, that includes genomic instability, telomere attrition, epigenetic alterations, and loss of protein integrity and homeostasis or pro proteostasis. And then there are the three, what he called the antagonistic hallmarks or our body's response to the damage. And these include dysregulated nutrient sensing, mitochondrial dysfunction, and cellular senescence. And finally, what called the integrative hallmarks are the culprits, quote unquote, of the phenotype. And that will include stem cell exhaustion and altered intercellular communication. So all these hallmarks, as you will see, will interplay and variously in certain diseases. And what I'm showing you here on the left graph is for COPD. And these are the important processes that are the hallmarks of the aging lung in a COPD patient. So having said this, uh, talking about aging and its effect on our lungs, then again, we will be able to show we need to differentiate patients with actual biologic age and the chronological age of the person. And in this slide, I would like to share with you the Dunedin study from New Zealand. It's a population representative um, cohort study of more than a thousand young adults who were followed from birth to age 38 years. And this was published in 2015. And what they did was they looked at various parameters and um, various biomarkers biomar to reflect on aging. And interestingly, what they showed in these individuals of the same chronological age who were otherwise healthy at age 38, 25% of them actually showed different biologic age. And it was a normal distribution. Some actually uh, look at, uh, their age is younger than the other uh, biologic age, younger than their actual chronologic age, and some go as old as age 50. And what they show 
Healthy adults who are aging faster exhibited deficits in physical cognitive functioning relative to slower aging peers. So we will expect that there is a direct correlation between biologic age and chronological aging. But as we've seen, there are individuals with quote-unquote accelerated aging. Perhaps genetic environmental risk factors are involved. Smoking is a strong one. Obesity is a strong one. And they will show exaggerated prema or premature decline of the hallmarks of aging. But then again, we show patients with quote-unquote healthy aging. Their lungs are younger than, than their actual age, maybe because of lifestyle modifications, exercise, diet modifications, or they're probably lucky. They, they have the longevity genes or some epigenetic program. So what is the effect of aging in the respiratory system? In general, structural changes that we see are, number one, changes in the lung structure. We have altered collagen fiber network, resulting in dilated alveolar ducts and enlargement of alveoli, and loss of elastic recoil of the lungs. And you will see here in my graphs, the uh, photomicrograph of the lung parenchyma of a 29-year-old non-smoker, compare it with a 100-year-old non-smoker. And you will see here the emphysematous alveolar sacs. As well, there are changes in the extrapulmonary structures. There is decreased chest wall compliance, including reduced thickness of the parietal muscles, degenerative changes of the spine, like kyphosis, and stiffening of the rib cage. And there's increased AP diameter of the chest, decreased curvature of the diaphragm, decreased respiratory muscle mass. So these are the structural changes. What are their effects on physiology? So with alveolar enlargement and reduced elastic recoil pressure of the lung, we will, what we will see is decreased in FEV1 and decreased in forced vital capacity, as you will see here, with an increase in the functional residual capacity and probably increase in total lung capacity as well. Airway closure and reduced chest wall compliance and decreased respiratory muscle strength will lead to as well, an increase in FRC and an increase in residual volume. On the other hand, the chest wall changes will actually cause a decrease in TLC, such that these two effects tend to cancel each other so that in aging, TLC is usually preserved. How about the effect on lung function? And what I'm showing you here is the volume that we will see on spirometric testing of FEV1 and FVC. And as we will see from this graph, the, you will see that a grad, after the age of around 30 to 35, we will see an, a gradual decline in lung function. In this study, about 20 mils in subjects aged 25 to 39, and about to increasing to 38 mils in individuals 65 years and older. And on the right side graph, we'll show you the flow volume curve. This is that of a normal healthy individual. Compare it with a patient who's older or in the, um, more than uh, like here, mean age of 71 years. There is decrease in peak flow and the expiratory flows show reduction with lower lung volumes. And we will consider this as a sort of an expiratory flow limitation. Remember this when we talk about asthma and COPD, which are obstructive airways diseases. The last two things that I want to talk about with the aging lung are the factors of involvement of comorbidities and adherence to medications. We of course know what comorbidities are and we talk about multimorbidities when you have coexistence of two or more chronic conditions in the same individual. And unfortunately, as we age, what you will see is for a 50-year-old patient, probably about half will have around one to at most four conditions that will be coexistent. But by the time the patient reaches 65, more and more conditions will be seen in such that multimorbidity is actually is what we see as the norm rather, rather than the exception in the elderly. 
And what is the effect of all these comorbidities? What they've shown, these diseases themselves will accelerate aging. So aging predisposes us to the chronic uh, diseases, and these diseases will in turn accelerate aging. And they found common underlying mechanisms variously. So these are, include lung diseases like COPD, metabolic diseases like diabetes and obesity, musculoskeletal, cancers, neurologic diseases including depression and Alzheimer's, and cardiovascular diseases. And all of these... There are two underlying common mechanisms. One, many of these pathways are driven by oxidative stress. And two, there seems to be a reduction in anti-aging molecules such as sirtuins, thus further accelerating the aging process. And finally, I would like to show you one huge uh, real-world study that looked at adherence. So more than 15,000 patients, and they measured the adherence rate to the treatment of eight leading treatment conditions. And as you will see from uh, chronic condition, as you will see from their graph, asthma and COPD were the worst conditions in terms of adherence among these uh, disease uh, disorders. And adherence was something like less than 60%. And in their cohort, more than half of their patients were actually 60 years or older. So that's the aging now. Now let's talk about the two chronic diseases that were assigned to me. First, asthma in the elderly. Unfortunately, despite the availability of effective asthma medications, it still kills. And what I'm showing you here, data from the Global Asthma Report, 2018 is the latest. Generally, the mortality rates are lower in high-income countries. Where is the Philippines? We're down there. Philippines actually ranks number two in asthma mortality for all ages and age 5 to 34 in the world. Now, DOH data will show you, the latest I can get, asthma and COPD are among the top 10 causes of deaths in the Philippines. And as you will see, unlike the rates of pneumonia and respiratory tract infections and tuberculosis where mortality rates are decreasing. For asthma and COPD, mortality rates are increasing in the Philippines. How about the state of asthma control? We conducted a study recently, a few years back, we called it Realize Asia Survey, although this was in younger individuals, less than 50 years old. And what you will see here, only 18% of patients actually had controlled asthma, as defined by uh, Global Initiative for Asthma or GINA criteria. And half of the patients actually had uncontrolled asthma. And we think this is the one that's driving asthma mortality. And interestingly, a study conducted in Europe using the same methodology, we had practically similar results. So, asthma epidemiology. And I'm showing you what we teach in terms of our Harrison's 20th edition. We look at asthma as a developmental disease of childhood, about half developing before age 10 and another third before age 40 years. But we now know and we're recognizing this it can begin in the elderly. What is the prevalence of asthma in older adults? The precise prevalence is difficult to ascertain. The reported pre various prevalence for adults more than 65 years, 4 to 13 percent, seems to be higher in females than males. The US NHIS data showed the un uh, reported an annual prevalence of self-reported asthma in these individuals of about 6.8 percent. But we think this is likely an underestimate. One, because of underreporting. Two, because of underdiagnosis, whether lack of suspicion of the disease. Two, breathlessness, dismissed as part of aging or masked by comorbidities like uh, congestive heart failure or anemia, or misdiagnosed as other obstructive airways disease. We see patients frequently being uh, diagnosed with quote unquote acute bronchitis or even COPD. What we do know is there is a higher burden of medical costs and hospitalization compared to the younger groups. And elderly patients with asthma are five times more likely to die from the disease than younger individuals. Now we know that asthma 
is a heterogeneous disease with various phenotypes and endotypes or biologic mechanisms. What I'm showing you here are the two common ph uh, endotypes, phenotypes that we see. The one that we know uh, more commonly is the pH2 high or type 2 in airway inflammation, which involves allergy, atopy, and um, IL-4, IL-5, IL-13 cytokines. And what has been seen in the studies, these patients tend to have more severe asthma. They have eosinophilia and increased pheno or um, exhaled nitric oxide. These are the individuals typically with early age of onset and they are atopic and have high IgEs. And they are responsive to inhibitions of type 2 inflammation, mainly inhaled steroids. So you'll see here an example, allergic asthma and those with late onset eosinophilic asthma. On the other hand, we've seen that there are patients with TH2 low or non-type 2 asthma. And these patients tend to have less severe disease. They have absence of eosinophilia. On the other hand, they are generally adult onset and they can become symptomatic and very difficult to manage when they are linked to obesity, to neutrophilia, like the ones that smoking associated, or smooth muscle uh, mediated, posigranulocytic uh, phenotype. And typically, these are the patients with poor inhaled steroid response. So that's epidemiology of asthma. Now, diagnosis of asthma. For all ages, the genome, latest guideline, 2019, released in April. Symptom-wise, still the usual. Increased probability, there's more than one type of symptom. We see shortness of breath, cough, or chest tightness, typically worse at night or early morning, varying over time and intensity, often triggered by exercise, etc., and improves with bronchodilators. And considering it in patients with strong history of atopy or childhood asthma and family history of asthma. And it's less likely when there are isolated symptoms accompanied by this shortness of breath, accompanied by dizziness, lightheadedness, and peripheral tingling, or chest pain, or inspiratory stridor. That's for all ages. The problem with the elderly is, number one, older uh, patients may be poor perceivers of dyspnea, even in the presence of significant airflow obstruction. As I mentioned, the dyspnea may be overlooked due to the comorbidities, and older patients will tend to limit their activity to avoid becoming dyspnea. Next, how do we confirm the diagnosis of asthma? Gina highly recommends confirming the variable airflow limitation. One, we want to see low FEV1, less than 80% of predicted, and a FEV1 over FVC ratio of less than 75%. And we want to see an acute bronchodilator response, that is an increase in FEV1 of more than 12% and an absolute increase of 200 mils from baseline after uh, an inhaled SABA or equivalent. So we want to see this. Now, consider the elderly patient. Gina recommends we should use the same objective measures to confirm the diagnosis in our elderly patients. But I've already shown you that FEV1 over FVC ratio tends to decrease with aging Therefore, when we actually look at these numbers, we need to look at predicted values that are age-adjusted to avoid overdiagnosis of obstru obstruction. FVC sometimes will be very difficult for an elderly individual for that long exhalation time. So we use a surrogate, FEV1, over the FEV at the sixth second. Bronchial hyperresponsiveness to bronchoprovoking uh, provoking agents like methacholine is a hallmark of bronchial hyperresponsiveness in asthma. And unfortunately, with aging, this tends to be reported to be increased. So it may be less accurate in this age group. And the third, a uh, fourth consideration should be spirometry and the standard bronchoprovocation tests are all effort dependent maneuvers. Fortunately, we've shown, uh, we've seen that 80% of our older individuals 
can achieve ATS acceptable results, American Thoracic Society criteria. But consider these things. These may be difficult for those who are frail. And finally, exhaled nitric oxide, phenol, which we use when we work up difficult to treat and severe asthma, there are few studies in the elderly. So that's for diagnosis. Next, assessment of asthma. Asthma control, as defined by Gina, covers two domains. One is assessing symptom control in the past four weeks, and secondly, to assess future risk of adverse outcomes. So this is the table that we use to assess asthma control. So we ask the patients in the past four weeks, has the, do you have daytime asthma symptoms more than twice a week or reliever use more than twice a week? Any night weakening due to asthma or any activity li limitation due to asthma in the past month? If negative response for all, then that asthma is well controlled. If at least three re yes responses to here, then that asthma is uncontrolled. And one to two, partly controlled asthma. <laughs> Next, assessing risk factors for poor outcome. And what I will show you now are the risk factors for exacerbations. And that can lead to increased mortality. And number one here is uncontrolled asthma symptoms. And other modifiable risk factors, even if the patient is asymptomatic. One, medications. High sub-use. Two, inadequate ICS use. Three, poor adherence. Four, incorrect inhaler technique and or poor adherence. As well, continuing exposure to smoke, smoking, allergens, the presence of comorbidities, and psychological and socioeconomic problems. And finally, lung function that's slow to start with and higher bronchodilator reversibility. And as I've mentioned, those patients with type 2 airway inflammation. And history of ever uh, intubation or an ICU admission for asthma or at least one severe exacerbation in the past year are also risk factors for a succe uh, succeeding exacerbation. There are also risk factors for developing persistent airflow limitation. Let me emphasize again the importance of lack of ICS treatment and continuing exposure to noxious or, stim or occupational stimuli and risk factors for medication side effect. So I've tackled epidemiology, assess diagnosis assessment. Now for the crooks of asthma management, um, asthma uh, in the elderly or for all individuals. What is new in the management of asthma? And I wanted to show this to you, not only for the elderly, because there is a paradigm shift in the way we manage asthma um, as uh, recommended by the strategies of GINA. So first of all, asthma pharmacotherapy will cover, since asthma is basically airway inflammation, inflam uh, chronic eosinophilic with acute exacerbations, and therefore the uh, airways will be swollen, there, there's bronchial hyperresponsiveness, or they're irritable, and there can be mucus plugging. So the hallmark will be for persistent asthma, you need maintain, uh, patients will need maintenance treatment of controllers or preventer medications. And inhaled corticosteroids are the most effective. When the patients are still symptomatic, despite inhaled corticosteroids, the add-on controller of choice, evidence A level, um, is a combination of ICS and long-acting beta agonists. On the other hand, in the presence of triggers, the patients can develop bronchospasm, smooth muscle spasm, and therefore a second class will be needed. The reliever, or what we call quick-acting or rapid-acting bronchodilators, and these are only used as needed treatment. The GINA 2019 management is still a control-based cycle that will cover assessing the patient in terms of confirming the diagnosis, looking at symptom control and modifiable risk factors, addressing comorbidities, again, inhaler technique and adherence, and addressing patient goals. And then we adjust the treatment, not only of the asthma medications, but 
the modifiable risk factors and comorbidities, non-pharmacologic strategies, including environmental control, and patient education and skills training, where asthma management planning is involved. And finally, reviewing the responses, not only in terms of symptoms, but in reducing exacerbations, side effects, and uh, declining lung function, but of course, patient satisfaction. So the next graph will show you the GINA guidelines as late as 2018. So five steps from mild to severe asthma. In 2018, in the patients with mildest of asthma, or what we call intermittent asthma, that is symptoms less than twice a month with no exacerbation or risk factors, as you can see in 2018, no controller was recommended. And the recommendation was PRN SABA as the preferred treatment of choice. And there is a big change in 2019. And I would like to summarize those changes with one pictograph. That blue inhaler has been found to be a killer. Over-reliance on SABA increases mortality. The regular or frequent use of SABA has been found to be associated with various adverse effects, including beta receptor down regulation, decreased bronchoprotection, rebound hyperresponsiveness, decreased bronchodilator response, and increased allergic response, and paradoxically, an increase is nephilic airway inflammation. And in many, many studies, higher use of SABA was, has been shown to be associated with adverse clinical outcome. Dispensing at least three canisters per year, that's about 1.7 puffs per day, is associated with a higher risk of ER visits. And dispensing at least 12 canisters per year, that's one month to uh, one Saba inhaler per month, is associated with a higher risk of death. So therefore, for GINA 2019, the landmark changes for step one, GINA no longer recommends SABA only treatment. So, and I've shown you the reasons for this. And what GINA now recommends is for all adults, including our elderly and adolescents with asthma, they should receive symptom driven or regular low dose ICS containing controller if they are at risk for adverse outcomes to reduce the risk of serious exacerbations. And this Strategy is a population level risk reduction strategy, the same way we use statins and antihypertensives. So, for GINA 2019, therefore, the recommendation for step one, that's intermittent asthma, you will see here as needed, low dose, fixed dose ICS with formoterol. Now, formoterol is a long acting beta agonist, but it's also rapid acting. Or low dose ICS taken whenever SABA is taken. And these recommendations are largely based on two major studies, and they were called the SIGMA trials, which looked at the efficacy and safety of as needed budesonide and a rapid acting beta agonist for Moterol in patients with mild asthma. The study actually looked at step two, or mild persistent asthma. These were published in the New England in May of 2018. It's a multi-center, multi-country study. And as you will see, the Philippines was involved. In fact, we contributed more than 400 patients, some of the biggest population in this study. And I was a clinical trialist for this study. And just to give you a summary of the SIGMA trials, comparing budesonide for Moterol as needed to as needed SABA showed that Budesonide for Motorol as needed, and I will call this now anti-inflammatory reliever therapy, was superior to as needed SABA in terms of controlling asthma symptoms, reducing what they call the well-controlled asthma week by 14%, but more importantly, in preventing the risk of severe exacerbation, risk reduction by as much as 64%. On the other hand, comparing it to the gold standard of ICS maintenance with PRN SABA, what Sigma the Sigma studies showed was anti-inflammatory reliever, comparing it to ICS maintenance, they had the same risks for severe exacerbation. 
So comparable risk, but this efficacy was achieved with a significantly lower steroid load, load as much as 75% less. However, in terms of symptom control, low-dose ICS maintenance was superior to as needed with ethanide for motorol. So the well-controlled asthma weeks were uh, increased by 36%. But these results were not really entirely unexpected given that these were RCTs and the adherence was so good, more than 60%. It was a highly controlled environment. The patients were closely monitored. The minute they miss a pop, we call them. Whereas in the real world, we've shown that adherence is actually ranges from 30 to 40%. And of course, it under, underpins the importance of anti-inflammatory therapy in asthma to prevent symptoms and exacerbations. So the recommendations for step one were actually off-label and based on the SIGMA uh, trials. On the other hand, for step two patients, so these are patients with mild persistent asthma, they have infrequent asthma symptoms, but have at least one risk factor for adverse outcomes like exacerbations, or the asthma symptoms or the need for sabis about between twice a month to twice a week, or waking up at night due to asthma for at least once a month. Again, in 2018, the recommendation, gold standard, low-dose ICS as the preferred controller. But in 2019, the recommendation now, preferred options, first line, Still, daily low-dose ICS or as needed, low-dose ICS for motorol. So take note, this is still off-label. Um, it has not been approved in many countries. And uh, the data are basically just on budesonide for motorol. As an alternative, patients can continue with leukotriene receptor antagonists, particularly if they have concomitant allergic rhinitis, or based on studies, which I wasn't able to show you, like in step one, whenever a sub is taken, patient should take an ICS dose as well. So that's for mild persistent asthma. Now for step three, for moderate asthma. So these are patients who are symptomatic despite low-dose ICS or have trouble some symptoms most days or waking up at night at least once a week, especially if they have risk factors. So the recommendations for GINA 2019 a fixed dose combination of ICS LABA maintenance daily, low dose, or same level of evidence, preferred first line option, as needed low dose ICS for motorol, this time as maintenance and reliever therapy, what we call MARC. So uh, the studies on MARC are actually evidence A. They're pretty good, not only for moderate asthma, step three, but also for step four and step five, the severe asthmatics. Alternative to low-dose ICS LABA or MARC strategy, medium-dose ICS or low-dose ICS in combination with an anti In 2019, add-on the theophylline was actually taken out. And finally, severe asthma patients or those who are uncontrolled despite ICS LABA low dose. So here, the recommendation, GINA 2019's medium dose ICS LABA. High dose ICS, which was there in 2018, was stepped up to step five. So medium dose ICS LABA, and the alternatives will be high dose ICS and Add on long acting muscarinic antagonist like thiotopium, the soft mist inhaler, or add on anti leukotriene are already there. And finally, step five or severe asthma, the GINA 2019 actually had a separate pocket guide for these type of patients, those with difficult to treat and severe asthma. This is where personalized medicine in terms of asthma phenotypes come in, where add-on therapies that include biologics will be there. And this uh, guideline or these strategies actually show decision trees for the use of anti-IgEs like omalizumab, 
anti-IL-5 or anti-IL-5 receptor like mepolizumab, reslizumab, or benralizumab. And new in 2019, dupilumab, which is an anti-IL-4R, was added. Now, having mentioned the GINA 2019, the Philippine Consensus Report on Asthma Diagnosis and Management, we actually presented this in March, so earlier than the publication of GINA 2019. And as you will see, pretty similar to the GINA 2019 recommendations. What is different is here in step two. What you will see from in the Philippine guidelines, in step two, or even those mild persistent asthma, we're already recommending here as first-line choices, not only as needed ICS for Motorol, but the fixed dose combination of ICS LABA daily, low dose, rather than just low dose ICS. And there are two reasons for this. Number one, it's very difficult to find monotherapy with ICS in various parts of the country. And number two, what we found among our Filipino patients, they like quick relief. So we wanted a LABA there. So at least when they take a beta agonist, there is an inhaled stimulant. And the rest will be largely similar. Now, Let's talk about the elderly. The, unfortunately, many of the randomized controlled trials, which were the evidences used on the various strategies that I've shown, the elder, in, in these studies, the elderly were often excluded. So there really is limited drug efficacy data among the elderly. And consider this, uh, uh, considering those data that I've shown. Next, side effects are common in the elderly. Cardiotoxicity due to beta agonists, corticosteroids associated long-term use, especially high dose or oral, with skin bruising, osteoporosis, or cataract, or they may have problems in the eyes using beta blocker eye drops, and you know what that means. And we need to also ask this in our elderly individuals. The next is in choosing the type of inhaler that we will prescribe to our patients. If the patient, for example, has hand arthritis, you might have a difficulty in actuating an MDI device. It has muscle weakness, impaired vision, or weak inspiratory flow. They might have difficulty in using a dry powder inhaler. And consider that these patients have multimorbidities. They're, they have polypharmacy, uh, usually. So we would like to try to avoid multiple inhaler devices and complex medication regimen. So... That's asthma in the elderly in, what, 15 minutes? Now let's talk about COPD. Now as I've told you, COPD is a disease of older adults. And what we've seen is the, currently the fourth leading cause of death in the world. It's projected to be the third leading cause of death by 2020. Why? We expect the burden to increase in the coming decades because of continued exposure to COPD risk factors and increasing aging population. Key points that we need to remember, it is common, it's preventable, and it's treatable. The respiratory symptoms and the airflow limitation, unlike in asthma, are typically persistent. The airway and our alveolar abnormalities, as we see here, for example, are caused by significant exposure to noxious particles or gases. The most common respiratory symptoms are similar to asthma, dyspnea, cough, and or sputum production, but these are maybe underreported, particularly dyspnea in the elderly patients. But remember that these symptoms tend to be persistent and progressive in COPD. And the main risk factor is still tobacco smoking. Other environmental exposures, including biomass fuel, is important. We've shown this in the female non-smoking Asian, non-smoking Asian patient, and also we're seeing this air pollution can contribute. So let's talk about FEV1 decline in lung function again. So for patients without COPD, normal lungs to start with, and this is the gradual decline in lung function that I talked about. If to start with, the patient will have a smaller, uh, smaller lung functions, then there will be a decline in lung function, which will, be, uh, will tend to be lower. 
the same slope as patients with no COPD. On the other hand, if a patient had normal initial FEV1 but smoked or has alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, what we will see a rapid decline in lung function that leads to COPD. And if to start with that patient had small air, small lungs, then that reduction will also be seen. Actually, if you will look at this in terms of studies, what they've shown is that the decline in lung function was actually the loss was greater in patients with milder COPD. In goal two, that's, um, I'll tell you about what goal two is later on, compared to the more severe COPD. And this downward spiral starts with breathlessness, leading to increased inactivity, leading to deconditioning and reduced exercise capacity, and um, impaired quality of life, eventually leading to disability and mortality. And with exacerbations, particularly frequent, this further works on reducing that, uh, increasing that decline in lung function. Altogether, this can become a vicious cycle. So what is the recommendation for assessing, diagnosing, and managing a COPD patient? The Global Initiative for COPD, or what we call GOAT, also published recently a 2019 update, and we call it the ABCD assessment tool. So first, we need to confirm in those patients that lung function abnormality. That is, FEV1 over FBC less than 70% of predicted compared to age and height and sex. Next, we would like to assess the severity of that airflow limitation from grade one to four, that is mild uh, uh, severity, that's 80% or more of FEV1 predicted, moderate, Severity or goal two, 50 to 79 percent predicted. Severe or goal three, 30 to 49, and very severe, less than 30 percent. So we have a COPD patient that we diagnose. First, we grade it into this, and then finally, we would like to assess the same, the symptoms and future risks. So on the x-axis will be the patient's symptoms from mild to severe. We use validated questionnaires like the Modified Medical Research Council or the COPD assessment test questionnaires. Basically, more this leak will be on the right side. On the y-axis, on the other hand, are the history of moderate or severe exacerbation. If the patient had at least two of these or at least one that led to a hospital admission, patients will already be C or D category. If no risk for exacerbation, or there's one that did not lead to hospital admission, at least A or B. And therefore, patient with group A will have no symptoms and low risk for exacerbation. Grade B will have high symptom, lots of symptoms, but no risk for exacerbation. C will be no symptoms or small, no symptoms, but with at, there are at risk for exacerbations. And finally, the most severe, D, at risk for exacerbations and very symptomatic. So how will we manage this patient? The goal, as in asthma, still two domains, reduce symptoms, reduce risk. In reducing symptoms, we're talking about relieving symptoms, improving exercise tolerance and health status. And in reducing risk, we would like to see reduction, uh, prevention of disease progression and prevention and treating exacerbations and, of course, reduction in mortality. The primary management in stable COPD are still the bronchodilators. The inhaled bronchodilators are central to symptom management and they're usually given on a regular basis to prevent or reduce symptoms. That's evidence A. And just as a summary, the long-acting beta agonists or the long-acting muscarinic antagonists are usually preferred over their short-acting, except for those patients with really occasional dyspnea. On the other hand, the, long, the, the lamas have a greater efficacy on exacerbation reduction compared with labas and decreased hospitalization.
And the combination of labalamas in one cough of an inhaler have been shown to increase FEV1 and reduce symptoms and reduce exacerbations compared to monothel. So those are the bronchodilators. How about anti-inflammatory treatment? And here, uh, let me show you inhaled steroids. What they showed an ics laba combination is more effective than individual component in, prove, in improving a lot of the outcomes that we like compared to the individual components. Now, regular treatment with ICS, unfortunately, in COPD, unlike in asthma, has been associated with various adverse outcomes, principal of which is pneumonia. They've also shown some increase in the incidence of TB, particularly for those where they are prescribed among those with severe diseases. And finally, there are already inhalers with triple therapy of ICS, LAMA, and LABA. They've shown to improve lung Function, symptoms, health status, and reducing exacerbation compared to the other combinations or LAMA monotherapy. Now, the goal 2019, um, what it showed is a number of recent studies have shown that if you look at the peripheral blood use in the field count, it may predict the magnitude of the effect of ICS. And the threshold use in gold is at least 300 cells per microliters, and we can use it to estimate the likelihood of beneficial preventive response in, to the addition of ICS to regular bronchodilator treatment. So the treatment of stable COPD by GO 2019 is broken down to first the initial pharmacologic treatment. So in grip A, a bronchodilator we can be a, a short acting if patients really uh, um, practically seem asymptomatic. For group B, on the other hand, a LABA or a LAM. For group C, the first line drug recommended is a LAMA. On the other hand, for patients who are very symptomatic or at risk, three choices. One, if they haven't taken it before, monotherapy with LAMA. Two, if they've taken LAMA before, or uh, they're very symptomatic, then LAMA plus LABA. A fixed dose ICS LABA may be used for patients with eosinophilia counts of at least 300 cells. Once we've done this, again, the same management cycle as in asthma, and on follow-up, if the response to initial treatment is appropriate, maintain it. If not, GOAL 2019 recommend personalized phenotypic management in terms of the predominant trait that we want to target, whether it's dyspnea or exacerbation. And following adjustment, we again regularly assess response. So if the predominant problem of the patient is dyspnea, if the patient was already on a LABA or a LAMA, then fix those IC, uh, IC, uh, LABA-LAMA is the next drug of choice. On the other hand, if the patient was actually on triple therapy or given LABA ICS, but the patient still symptomatic, or consider de-escalation of the ICS if, uh, or switch. If pneumonia is a problem, the inappropriate original indication there's, or there's lack of response. So again, LABA, LAMA. And of course, switching to inhaler devices or molecules and investigating other causes of this. On the other hand, if the main problem is exacerbation or exacerbation and dyspnea, there are two choices, again, LABA or LAMA and ICS LABA. LABA, ICS, I've already told you about this. LABA LAMA, on the other hand, um, you may consider it earlier for the reasons that I've uh, given you late, uh, a while ago. If there's a problem with pneumonia or there's no response to ICS or there's no indication for ICS use. If the patient's already on labalama and still has exacerbations, and even if the patient fills at least 100 mils, then consider triple therapy. If the ES levels are less than 100, but the FEV1 is less than 50%, and the patient has the chronic bronchitis phenotype, then a PDE, anti-PDE4 or roflumila, like roflumilas may be indicated. And finally, patients who are former smokers who keep on having bacterial exacerbations, maintenance, low-dose acetromycin is already there. 
And the last few slides, I'd like to talk about comorbidities in COPD. So we use the term comorbidome for comorbidities with at least 10% prevalence, and they have associated strong association with mortality. If death is here, the bull's eye, what you will see here are the various comorbidities, and that includes the various cancers, how big the bubble is depends on the prevalence, the various cancers, but as well, you will see here anxiety, um, reflux, um, the renal ulcers, and the con um, congestive heart failure, etc. So in these patients, we need to address as well in COPD. So I've talked about my three, and for my last few minutes, sorry, a few over time, let's talk about asthma and COPD when they exist in the same patient. So the gold and the GINA have a separate uh, strateg strate uh, strategic recommendations for this, and we use the, the term e asthma COPD overlap. It's not a definition, but a description for clinical use. When? A patient will have features of both asthma and COPD. Um, and looking at it, identifying it in clinical practice, but again, this is not a syndrome, it's not a definition, because there are several different clinical phenotypes and there may be several different underlying mechanisms. So just a background there for ACO. I, the problem with patients with both asthma and COPD, they've been shown to have worse outcomes frequent exacerbations to higher mortality to greater healthcare utilization. And what they've shown, the prevalence varies from 15 to 20 percent, 15 to 55 percent. So, but it is important and we do see it. Now, asthma COPD overlap, it can have a lot of phenotypes. I've shown you that patients with persistent airflow limitations, we do see it in patients who had severe asthma, from childhood and ongoing in smokers and those other patients that I've shown you. And we also see it in patients with COPD with increased sputum and blood using fields. And this is important, as I've mentioned, because these are the phenotypes that may respond to corticosteroids. So the Golden Gina recommend an approach that is stepwise, consisting of five levels in the diagnosis and initial management. So step one is does that patient have chronic airway disease? And we talked about the diagnosis and how to suspect it. Next, step two is a syndromic assessment where we look at the features of the patient and there are at least three features for asthma or COPD, then that's the more likely correct diagnosis. On the other hand, if there's a lot of overlap, then that's when we consider ACO. So it looks something like this, and you look at the features if present that will suggest it, two, four, six, seven of them, whether asthma or COPD, that, that includes chest x-ray. So three at least feature, uh, three or more features of asthma, then this is asthma, three or more features for COPD, then it is COPD. But if there's a lot of overlap, consider ACO. The step three is if a spirometry or lung function test has not yet been done, then we do need to show spirometry, the reversible airflow limitation in asthma and the persistent airflow obstruction of COPD. And step four is the initial treatment. So for asthma, maintenance therapy, ICS is the first line drug again. And in asthma, unlike COPD, no LABA monotherapy. For COPD, on the other hand, I've shown you the long-acting beta uh, bronchodilators are up there. And finally, step five treatment, specialized investigation. If the patients are still symptomatic, there are prob other problems or there are significant uh, uncontrolled comorbidities. So in the past, sorry, 55 minutes, I covered the aging lung, the two very important diseases in the Philippines, and how to manage when the patient has ACO. That is my last slide. Now it's time for my Starbucks cafe in here. Thank you very much. Okay. So thank you, Dr. Wang, for that comprehensive talk. We would like to acknowledge Novartis Philippines, our sponsor for today's webinar. We now have 31 viewing through 
ఈ విమనిల లైవ్ స్ట్రీమ్ ఎయిటీ టూ టు యూట్యూబ్ లైవ్ అండ్ ఫైవ్ హండ్రెడ్ ఫార్టీ త్రీ టు ఫేస్బుక్ లైవ్ అండ్ గ్రూప్స్ వ్యూవింగ్ ఫ్రమ్ ఆల్ ఓవర్ ద ఫిలిపీన్స్ ద ఫ్లోర్ ఇస్ నా ఓపెన్ ఫర్ క్వశ్చన్స్ ఫ్రమ్ ది ఆడియన్స్ జస్ట్ టైప్ ఇన్ యూర్ క్వశ్చన్ అట్ ద క్యూ అండ్ ఎయిట్ చాట్ బాక్స్ ఇన్ ద రైట్ లోవర్ కార్నర్ ఆఫ్ ద లైవ్ స్ట్రీమ్ విండో ఆర్ టైప్ ఇన్ కామెంట్స్ ఇన్ యూట్యూబ్ లైవ్ ఆర్ సెండ్ పర్సనల్ మెసేజెస్ టు FB at Aging Webinars for Facebook Live viewers. Okay, so we have um, several questions now. So our first question from G. Icardo Tenorio. Uh, she asks, do you recommend patients with asthma to undergo annual pulmonary function tests? So if they have asthma, we actually recommend um, Uh, regular lung function testing, one, to diagnose it, and two, to assess response to treatment. Okay, okay so thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Um, for the next question from Dr. Joey Canel, she asks, I thought my adult onset asthma would get better over time, but it hasn't improved over the decades. Is it really just symptoms control for me forever? <laughs> so, Joey, you have yes. asthma? <laughs> Hi, Joe. Oh. Can we talk to them? Oh, no. Oh, okay. Sorry. We can talk to you. So, unfortunately, as I've shown you, asthma in the elderly is actually increasing prevalence with increasing uh, aging population and all those factors that we talked about. And secondly, um, it's been associated with urbanization, the increase in uh, um, atopy and other allergic diseases. So, unfortunately, once an asthmatic, always an asthmatic. So oh. if, with persistent symptoms, we need maintenance medications mm -hmm. to control those symptoms. There is no cure for asthma, unfortunately. Oh, that, that is very unfortunate. And then we have another question from Ligaya Batara. She asks, is caffeine can ease difficulty of breathing and asthma? Caffeine. Caffeine, yes. yes. You know that it has bronchodilator properties. In fact, uh, if you look at the history of asthma treatment, Uh, Dr. Osler, uh, one of our asthma gods, recommended the use of drinking hot, nice hot coffee for asthma way back when those drugs were not yet available. But of course, you know, you all know the systemic side effects of coffee. Do you have any more questions? Just type in your questions at our question and answer box at the lower portion. So we have another question right now. Uh, this question is from Donna Marie Ortiz. She asks, is it true that if you have asthma when you are young, it will come back when you get old? Yes. So very interesting. So uh, as I've mentioned, about uh, half of the patients will develop it before age 10. But fortunately, many of these kids will, quote unquote, asthma disappears or it undergoes remission. But it will tend to recur, one, if the asthma was uncontrolled to start with. And unfortunately, for some patients, for whatever reasons, whether it's uh, exposure to environmental triggers, um, asthma can do come back, it does come back in adulthood. And once it comes back, it's unlikely to disappear. Well, I understand. That's why there are many patients coming in from... Yes, and that's um, why we have a lot yeah, of patients. Yes, so parang they always mention that my asthma will already resolve, but now it's coming back. Yes. So I guess it's also a matter of um, environmental factors as well as exposure. Yes, that's right. And uh, as I said, one of the things that we consider when we suspect asthma is a childhood history of asthma or a very strong family history of asthma. Okay, thank you very much. We also have um, another question from Ian Santos. Ian asks, what is the effectiveness of pulmonary rehabilitation for COPD patients? Grade A level of evidence. Yes. So improving quality of life, reducing exacerbation, improving uh, health status and symptoms, etc. So I'm, I'm sorry I wasn't able to talk about it. Do you have any more questions from the panel, from the group? No. All right, we're gathering questions. 
Okay. So another question from Anna, Anna Santos. Um, she asked regarding uh, diet. Is ketogenic diet recommended for COPD elderly patients? Lower RQ of fats. I am sorry, I don't know the answer to that question. <laughs> I'll have to get back to you okay. on that. We'll get back, okay. Miss Anna. Thank you. So we'll check for more questions from the live panel. Okay. Oh. The next question from Gigi Baron Reynoso. Um, chronic steroid trigger glaucoma for which beta blocker drops are sometimes used. How do we deal with this double-edged sword? Yes. Hi. Hi, classmate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so it is a problem among the elderly. So um, sometimes we need to, it may be contraindicated in patients really with um, asthma. Sometimes I, I understand you can use those uh, beta-selective drugs in COPD patients with um, uh, cardiac problems. We use cardio-selective beta blockers. So, but as well, we need to treat the ICS. But if it is triggering asthma or causing bronchospasms and all those problems, sometimes we really have to call our ophthalmologists and ask for other medications that can be used. Okay. So, and then we have another question from um, Lorenzo de Guzman. He asks, what particular non-pulmonary comorbidities predispose elderly patients to asthma exacerbations? So what comorbidities? Non-pulmonary comorbidities predispose elderly patients to asthma exacerbations. Okay. So the number one that we've actually seen is obesity. The obese female phenotype is, uh, has been found to be in, in studies uh, important in patients who are very symptomatic or those who develop it late onset or those who tend to be corticosteroid resist resistant. So that's one important thing that they So usually the obese patients are more prone to exacerbations. And then we have more questions coming through. We have a question from Ms. Lina Lin. Uh, Sheena Lin, I'm so sorry. Do you recommend any physical exercise? For elderly suffering asthma or COPD, COPD that can help. Yes. We do have prescribed um, chest physical therapy and pulmonary rehab exercises. I'm sorry, I don't have the time to cover this, but yes, um, exercise and how to manage asthma, including even in, um, how to control breathing, how to increase upper arm uh, resistance and strength. Uh, we have prescribed um, rehab therapy for that. So there are physical exercises that yes. can help in controlling your asthma. Yes. That's very nice. All right. And then another question from Trina Ann. She asked, is it true that obese children can easily develop asthma? Uh, that's a very interesting question. They also see that the obese asthmatic, they tend to have more symptoms and they tend to have more exacerbations. So... Can obesity itself cause asthma? Um, I don't think uh, studies have been shown to definitively show that, but it is a risk factor. It has been found to be a risk factor for the development of asthma. All right. So um, that's very informative, Dr. Ewang. So I think that is the last question for our session this afternoon. So in summary, we learned from the webinar the physiologic changes in lung function with aging as well as the hallmark of different pulmonary conditions of the aging lung. We also learned the challenges in the approach of COPD and asthma in the elderly and how it's different in younger adults. And then lastly, we have learned the updated management guidelines of COPD and asthma, not only in elderly, but also in all ages, according to the new guidelines from the GINA and GOLD 2019. With that, we would like to thank Dr. Eileen Wang for thank taking time much. out of her busy schedule and sharing your expertise with us today. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank, thank you, you, webinar team. All right. So please join us again for next week's webinar, Taking Care of the Aging Kidneys with Dr. Elizabeth Montemayor. We would also like to acknowledge our role of donors for the 85th anniversary of the Mu Sigma P sorority.
And lastly, please also join the UPM web, UPMed webinars every Wednesday. And please stay tuned for some reminders. Thank you. The Aging and Longevity Medical Webinars team of the Mu Sigma Phi Sorority would like to thank our partners, the UP College of Medicine, UP Medical Foundation, and the Mu Sigma Phi Foundation. We are also grateful to support from the Postgraduate Institute of Medicine, UP Manila Information Management Service, and DOST ASTI, and the PRC Board of Nursing. Most of all, we thank you, our participants, for spending your lunch hour with us. To receive your certificates of attendance, kindly answer the evaluation through the link that will be sent to your email addresses after you sign the attendance sheet for today's webinar. The certificates will then be emailed to your registered email addresses within two to four weeks. Here is a quick view of the schedule of our upcoming webinars. For more details and updates, please check our Facebook page at facebook.com slash agingwebinars and our Twitter timeline at twitter.com slash agingwebinars. Today's webinar recording and all webinar recordings may be viewed at YouTube at Aging Webinars channel. We are also announcing the launch of the OB Pearls book. Get your copies now. Thank you and have a great day.